This is Lecture 9, Cartilage and Bone Histology. We're now moving into Exam 2, and over the next seven lectures, we will discuss the skeletal system and articulations. This will be followed by a series of lectures on the muscular system. There is an intimate relationship between the skeletal system and the muscular system that provide multiple examples of co-evolved structure function relationships. The skeletal system itself is made of bones, cartilage, ligaments, and connective tissue to stabilize the skeleton. Bones, remember, are dynamic organs, which consist of several tissue types. The functions of the skeletal system are support, movement or leverage, protection, to store minerals, primarily that of calcium, and the production of red blood cells. The first type of tissue that we'll talk about in the skeletal system is cartilage. Cartilage is a type of connective tissue, and its matrix is a firm gel containing chondroitin sulfates. The physical properties are dependent upon the matrix components, as there are many different types of cartilage. However, there's only one type of cell found inside of cartilage, and that is the chondrocyte. These are found in small chambers called lacunae. Cartilage is avascular. And in adults, it's incapable of regeneration or healing as there are no stem cells. Some of the outer portions of some cartilage can see some minor regeneration, but by and large, there's no regeneration that is capable, which is why cartilage damage uh, wears out a lot like brake pads. It's set apart from surrounding tissues by the parachondrium. The parachondrium is going to be a connective tissue layer going around, peri meaning around, the cartilage. It consists of two layers, the outer layer of dense irregular connective tissue, which provides mechanical support, protection, and attachment, and an intercellular layer, where cartilage grows during development and allows for cartilage maintenance. Cartilage grows in two main ways, appositional growth and interstitial growth. Appositional growth is going to be growth that occurs in cellular layers like rings of a tree. Growth will occur as a result of the stem cells, or mesenchymal stem cells, in the cellular layer of the perichondrium. These cells differentiate into chondroblasts, which produce matrix. These cells are eventually surrounded by the matrix and become adult chondrocytes, the cartilage cells. The appositional growth results in adding additional layers of tissue, as can be seen above. Here, we can see those cells differentiating from the perichondrium and starting to exude matrix and thicken over time. This will be the development of cartilage in an appositional fashion. Interstitial growth is going to be like inflating a balloon. Here, chondrocytes divide into daughter cells with each cell producing more matrix. This results in growth of the cartilage from the inside, so these cells will already be inside, not extending from the perichondrium, and they will divide and expand from within. Now there are three types of cartilage, hyaline, elastic, and fibrous. Hyaline cartilage is going to be found between the bones of the joints and in the tracheocartilage rings. Additionally, it also makes up the blueprint for what our body will become when we are an infant. So all of our bones are more uh, hyaline cartilage based when we're infants and then they gradually calcify and get stronger and thicker as they get older. The function of hyaline cartilage is to provide flexible support and reduce friction. Its matrix is gel-like. Here we can see the hyaline cartilage. It has kind of a clearish gel-like matrix with the chondrocytes that exist in the lacunae. Note the translucent matrix and the absence of prominent fibers. Hyaline cartilage is found in between joints, as stated previously, and makes up the, the different articular surfaces of bones, acting as a way to reduce friction where bones are going to touch or articulate with one another. The next type of cartilage is elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilage is found in the auricle or the outer ear, as well as the astuchin tube, which will connect the middle ear to the back of the nose, and in the epiglottis. There's some debate on whether or not elastic cartilage is found in the nose as well. The function of this is to provide flexible, elastic support so it distorts without damage and returns to its original shape. The matrix of this is also gel. The prominent feature, the prominent feature that is different is going to be the elastic fibers that are going to dominate the matrix here. 
we can see the chondrocytes, again, that exist in the lacunae and the elastic fibers that are going to perpetuate throughout. This will, again, provide that support and allow for some sort of distortion without damage. The final type of cartilage is called fibrous cartilage or fibrocartilage. This is found in the meniscal pads within the knee joints, in the glenoid labrum of the shoulder joint, as well as the acetabular labrum of the hip joint, and in the pubic symphysis. Its function is to resist compression. Its matrix is gel. There's very little ground substance here in the fibrous cartilage, and it lacks a perichondrium. So there's a lot of collagen fibers. Here we can see the fibrous matrix of the fibrocartilage. Note the extremely densely packed collagen fibers that exist separating the chondrocytes from one another. Bone is another type of connective tissue and this makes up a bulk of the skeletal system. Bone itself is an osseous tissue. It has specialized cells or osteocytes and a solid crystalline matrix. It has a very small volume of ground substance with two-thirds of the matrix being calcium salts. And there are many collagen fibers dominating the bone. This adds for a great degree of flexibility. The outer lining of bone has a connective tissue layer called the periosteum, whereas the inner lining of bone just before the medullary cavity is called the endoosteum. Here we can see a histological slide with the periosteum as well as the endosteum on the either side of the compact bone. Periosteum will be on the outside, endosteum on the inside. When comparing that of cartilage and bone, both offer support and protection. However, cartilage is avascular, whereas bone is highly vascular. This means that bone has a rapid and extensive repair process as well as remodeling whereas cartilage cannot grow itself or repair. Some other differences between them to compare and contrast, the cell for cartilage is chondrocytes, whereas in bone it's osteocytes. The ground substance for cartilage is chondroitin sulfate, whereas in bone it's going to have calcium salts with a very small volume of liquid. Fibers for cartilage are going to be in varying proportions of collagen, elastic, and reticular, depending upon the type of cartilage you're dealing with, whereas in bone, it's almost entirely collagen fibers. Vascularity is going to be no vascularity in cartilage, extensive in bone. The covering in cartilage is perichondrium, which is in two layers, and periosteum, for bone, it's in two layers. And the strength of cartilage is limited. It bends easily, but is hard to break, whereas bone is very strong and resists distortion until its breaking point. There are four different types of cells that make up the mature bone. First is osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are immature bone cells. Think it's a blast to be alive. Blast always means a young, immature cell. They're found on the inner and outer surfaces of bone near the endo and periosteal layers, and they produce osteoid, which is involved in making the new matrix. It's the basic concrete and foundation for what new matrix will become. Osteoblasts are involved in building of bone, the making of new bone. This is a process called osteogenesis. Osteoblasts will convert to osteocytes after they have securely built bone around themselves. Osteoclasts are antagonistic to osteoblasts. Clasts are destroyers. They secrete acids which dissolve the bones, thereby causing the release of stored calcium ions and phosphate ions into the blood. This is a process that is called osteolosis. Osteocytes are mature bone cells. These form from osteoblasts that become trapped inside of the matrix that they've built of osteoid. They maintain the protein and mineral content of the matrix. The final cell is an osteoprogenitor cell. These are the youngest form of cells just underneath an osteoblast and they are found on the inner and outer surfaces of bone. They differentiate to form new osteoblasts and osteoclasts and are heavily involved in the repair of bones after a break. Here we can see a sample of each one of the bone cells. On the upper left, you'll see the osteocyte, the mature bone cell, inside of its matrix as it extends out a lot of its cellular projections, caniculi, in order to actually communicate with other cells around it, maintaining the matrix. Going to the right in a clockwise fashion, we have the osteoprogenitor cell, found on both the inside and outside of bone. Osteoprogenitor cells are stem cells who divide into other cells. 
Just beneath that, we have the osteoclasts. Remember that osteoclasts are destroyers. They secrete acids and break down the bone matrix. Whereas our last cell, osteoblasts, are going to secrete matrix and build bone. Here we can see the bone as it has been developed throughout, and we have the overall organizational layers. This organizational layer that we see is called an osteon. An osteon is going to be a circular structure of bone around a central canal of blood vessels. It looks like the rings of a tree, and that is largely due to how the bone itself grows out from the central canal. Each ring around the central canal consists of osteocytes in a concentric fashion. These concentric rings are called concentric lamellae. Here we can see the concentric lamellae as they're sent circling around the central canal and make up the rings of the osteon. We have the osteocytes in the dark circle structures that are going to be surrounding the central canal and inside of each one of these lacunae are the osteocytes and then we have caniculi or canals connecting the different osteocytes together. The last structure to note is the lamellae. There are concentric lamellae that will be surrounding the central canals but as circles meet up there's space in between these osteon circles and this will form the interstitial lamellae that we see in between these two osteons and central canals. This is the overall layout of compact bone and as it grows and thickens the space is going to be less and less between the different osteons. Now the structure of bone comes in two types. We have compact bone which is dense bone. Compact bones are dense and solid and they form the walls of the outlining of the medullary cavity and the medullary cavity consists of bone marrow itself. This is where blood cells are going to be made. Spongy bone or trabecular bone is going to be an open network of plates. This is typically found on the ends of bone whereas compact bone is going to be found in the central diaphysis or shaft of the bone. Here we can see different samples of our compact and spongy bone. Note the spongy bone is going to have a branch-like structure. It gradually thickens over time and becomes compact bone, but it starts off as a framework. Typically, the ends of bones are going to be more spongy bone, whereas the shaft of the bone will be more compact. Here we can see another sample structure of how the osteon forms from the initial trabecular bone and expands out, thickening as it gets along the shaft. When looking at the organization and representation of a long bone, we have a general structure of ends and shaft. The ends are the epiphysis. There is going to be a proximal end and a distal end of the epiphysis. The central structure is called the diaphysis or the shaft. They are connected to each epiphysis by the metaphysis. Typically where the metaphysis is found is going to be where the growth plates are. We can notice the diaphysis or shaft is where a large majority of the compact bone is and the spongy bone will be in the epiphysis. Here's a close-up view of an epiphysis. We can notice the articular surface of the femur as well as the trabecular or spongy bone that will make up a large majority of this. It thickens over time but it's going to involve a lot of remodeling and growth. 